Are you here? Hey, <laughs> we like it when you're here, tuned into the Paul Leslie Hour, indeed. You know, it's fascinating when a photo makes its way around the world, but the person in the picture isn't necessarily known. The inspiration and subject of this episode are connected to an album cover, Last Mango in Paris. You know it? Well, there's two people in the picture. One, of course, was Jimmy Buffett. But who's the other person? Hmm. Do you ever wonder about the story behind a picture? Jimmy Buffett once sang, A picture's worth a thousand words. Just ask a cameraman. <laughs> That's interesting and a, a good point. A photo at times can spark the imagination. It can even tell a story. Well, our guest, Aurora Diath Plaha Birch, has been photographed quite a lot. She said, Modeling or acting was a very unlikely pursuit for me. As a child, I hid from the camera, even begged my mother not to buy the school photos as I didn't want to trade mine with classmates. Aurora never would have considered a career as a model until working as a waitress at a disco nightclub in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. The hired photographer asked to do a photo shoot with her. You see, he wanted to enter her into a Miss Black Velvet contest with a $50,000 prize. And here's the thing. To enter the contest, you had to be 21. She wasn't. So the photographer gave her the photographs and encouraged her to take them to a modeling agency. Well, this was the beginning of a career in modeling, but as Aurora puts it, it was always a means to an end, and the end was to travel. From that standpoint, it was a success as she was able to travel to Japan and Spain. But remember the cover of Last Mango in Paris? That picture, you could say, is what led Paul to try to locate the woman who depicted the third world girl in Buzios. We are pleased to welcome her to tell you all a part of her story. And the Paul Leslie Hour is all about helping people tell their stories. Been doing it for a long time. Just go to www.thepaulleslie.com slash support, and we thank you. Hmm. If the phone doesn't ring, who is it? Okay, it's time. Shall we begin? Well, ladies and gentlemen... Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. And you can't really see, but right now, I'm holding in my hand a vinyl record. This is Last Mango in Paris, Jimmy Buffett's 1985 studio album. They say that radio is the theater of the mind. I'm looking at the picture, and I see Jimmy Buffett, which I would expect to see. And he's seated at a table, the very beautiful woman. He's got a pocket knife in his hand. She's got a menu. I look a little closer. There's a lot going on in this picture. I'm joined by Aurora Diaz Plaja. Say it again for me, Aurora. Aurora, Aurora Diaz Plaja Birch. Aurora Diaz Plaja Birch. Well, the Z's, the T's, and the J's, and H's, but that's fine. It's Aurora Diaz Plaja Birch, I guess, in the way anybody would look at it. It's D I A Z hyphen capital P L A J A. So tell us, Aurora, who is the woman in this photo? Well, uh, Aurora Diaz Plaja Birch. <laughs> <laughs> but in the photo, I was just Aurora Diaz Plaja prior to Birch. So you are the woman here in this photo. I am. I understand that there's been some motion about that. I, I find that very hard to believe, but you have been very patient about convincing me to let the world know who I am. I, I do commend you for your detective work in <laughs> finding me. I would certainly commend you. It's, uh, I had a different last name. I've lived many, many places, and, you know, it's, it's very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. So, so tell us, this is a, it's a very interesting photo. Where, what's the setting? Where was this photo taken? The cover of Last Mango in Paris. 
the cover was taken at uh, well, the front cover was taken at, at Galatoire's in New Orleans. We had all hoped it would be Paris, but it didn't work out. So, because if you listen to the song, it's Paris, obviously, even in the name. And he is holding the mango in his hand with the knife. But Galatoire's was a lovely setting, and we did the one-day shoot in Galatoire's. And the back cover was supposed to be Saigon. And we used the Louisiana swamps, or the bayous of Louisiana. And just as, as an aside, you know, people who live in Louisiana, I lived there twice. And as an aside, the people who live there call the mosquito the state bird. And I can attest <laughs> as the, at the shoot on the back cover, you know, I'm in shorts and a tank top. And I was just, I'm a, I'm a mosquito magnet anyway. I was just, I uh, just, just eaten alive. I just had welts everywhere. And when the mosquitoes that are that big bite you, I mean, just blood was coming down me and they stopped the shoot to wipe off blood. And he was completely covered up with the trench coat and all. And, and he wasn't bothered, but he did show a great deal of concern, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting stuff here. Now, tell us, if we zoom out a little of this photo, we can't see, but of course... There must have been a photographer who took this picture. So zooming out a little bit, who was the man or the woman who took these pictures? Louis Sayuk, who was a good friend of Jimmy Buffett, was a photographer. And again, if anyone's interested, you can look him up. He has beautiful photography of New Orleans. He used to have an apartment above his gallery on Jackson Square. He's passed away. I say used to only because he passed away. I'm sure his family owns it or it's been sold. But he was, a, he was a close friend of Jimmy Buffett. They used to gather at, at other restaurants besides Galatoire's. Galatoire's also, but a place called Two Jacks, where the album hung for a long time before somebody took it off the wall. And yeah, he was, he was a, a good photographer. And the uh, artist, the makeup artist, was Susan Spade, who was a very well-known makeup artist. And let me, you know, I cannot say enough about a great makeup artist and hairstylist on photo shoots. You know, it's the magic of makeup and photography that produces the pictures that you see in magazines and photo albums. <laughs> no, that's interesting. My wife right now is looking for a photographer to have some pictures made. So I'm sure she'll appreciate that, that little tidbit. Well, it's, it's very important. You know, the, the great photographers are known to be great photographers because of their talent in, you know, taking a canvas and you know, making it pop. So, hmm. yeah, very important. What are your memories of the the day or the days that these photos were taken? Oh, we had a great time. It was it was very comfortable. We did one day and, and very, you know, it's time consuming. We just did one day in the in the swamps, <laughs> Louisiana, and uh, you know, it's an all day shoot. We had a those are real guns in my belt and in my hands and the gold derringer that you see on the front cover i know nothing about guns but i do know it's a gold derringer is a real gun so we had an atf agent with us at all times on the shoot i i don't remember that they surely they weren't loaded i don't know why we had that <laughs> atf agent surely they wouldn't put a loaded gun in the hands of someone who knows nothing about guns but we did have an agent on hand and that was, I remember the gold derringer in the mirror, and I, and then I had a, a 357 in my belt on the back cover, and I have some kind of rifle, but I don't know enough about guns to tell you what it is, and I don't even know how to look it up. So maybe somebody can let me know what I was holding. <laughs> well, Aurora, you read my mind, because the next question that was going to slip out of my lips was, were the guns real? <laughs> yeah, they were real. They were definitely real. And, you know, you know, I was supposed to be the third world girl from Buzios with a pistol in each hand. Yeah, that, the guns were a little intimidating, but I don't remember feeling that at the time. You know, you just, it, you know, to me it was all kind of a, just a prop, but the ATF agent should have alerted me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it's an interesting photo as we're talking about here. It's kind of interesting because in in both of the photos you have a kind of a mysterious expression like you know something and then if you look closer which i've i've heard from people through the years who have said 
I had this album for years. I just now noticed the reflection. She has a gun in her hand. And Jimmy's, his expression is he's just joyous. Yeah, well, it's it's just, the, you know, I was I was just covering as he went from land to land. And so, you know, supposedly that's the, that's, that's Tony Terracino. Of course, the story is about him. So he's just joyous because we're having a good time. <laughs> we, we really did have a good time on the shoot. And the, the other day I didn't mention is, was just spent, you know, try, trying to find props. But what we wound up with was, just what I had. You know, I had brought some things that I thought might work, that cover with my shorts, my tank top, my belt, and the back, the front cover was my sister's red dress. And we, we looked all over the place for other things, but that's what we wound up using. <laughs> You're probably going to get somebody who is a collector now who's going to say, well, where's the red dress? <laughs> my closet. It's in my closet. Uh, <laughs> the red dress is in my closet. The... Tank top and shorts, eh, it probably is in somebody else's closet because I'd probably give it to Salvation Army or something. <laughs> <laughs> Even to keep them. I know it sounds terrible, but I just, you know, I just didn't think to do that. And I moved a lot, so I don't know where they are. <laughs> now, Aurora, did you hear at least the song or a demo of the song Last Mango in Paris before these photos were taken? I did not. Well, oh. I might have. Yeah, they, it came out in June, and we did the, we did, no, I don't think I did. Yeah, because it came out in June, and we did the shoot in April. No, I, I don't remember hearing the uh, the song. I might have read the words, but again, it was 39 years ago. <laughs> well. <laughs> i rusty in the memory department. As I kind of <laughs> zoom out a little more, my curiosity is, how did you end up in the photo? Was it the work of an agent? How did that come to be for our listeners? Oh, I have a just a wonderful agent. She's more than an agent. She's a, she is was and is a mother to me, and I've been privileged to have the Del Corral family part of my life for the last 45 years. I don't know why she adopted me as one of her children, but she did, and several others have the same privilege I do. But, you know, she had, she had the biggest biggest modeling agency in, in, the, in town. So she had many, many, many girls to pick from to mother, and I'm honored that she picked me. Anyway, after I, I, I modeled full-time after college for three years from 81 to January 84. And I had moved to bridge a distance gap with a man that I was, was, was my boyfriend at the time to see if that would work. By the way, it did not. But I, I moved to Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and I decided after modeling for three years, and the and the idea was to travel, and I did that in Spain and Japan, and that wasn't all the traveling I wanted to do, but it was about all the modeling I was really wanted to do at the time. It's a very superficial business. It's very difficult. You can't do it all your life unless you are Cindy Crawford or Cheryl Teagues or a Christy Brinkley. So when I got back from Japan... I had kind of filled in the, you know, the travel thing as far as the means to an end for modeling. And I really kind of, I wanted to pursue being on the other side of the camera in advertising. Not an easy thing because I realized when I started talking to advertising agencies that, you know, well, what did you do besides, you know, graduate in psychology and sociology and, and be a model and actress for three years? So they, they were looking for, I didn't have any production experience and such. Anyway, I was fortunate that I was in a, in a small town of Fort Walton Beach and there was an advertising agency there who was putting on a tourist show called Fun Forecast 84. Cable was new in the area, I think new in general. And we were, I think, the second market other than Atlanta to have a cable tourist show for people. I know it's everywhere now, but... We had tent cards and hotel rooms and such to advertise this tourist show, which was generally just the owner of Peterman Advertising, Dick Peterman and I, were the hosts, telling people about the area and, of course, advertising. People paid for advertising to show people their restaurants. So it's restaurants and aquariums and, you know, amusement parks and that kind of thing. So I was hired as the hostess or host hostess of the first show, 1984, I knew so many people in town. I've been going there since I was a child to that area. 
And so I started selling it, and uh, Dick Peterman said, well, you know, I'll give you 20% on anything you sell. So I wound up as an account executive with Peterman Advertising, as well as the hostess of each of these tour shows. It was Fun Forecast 84, and then 85, and then 86, and 87. And then, unfortunately, very sadly, Dick Peterman, who was my mentor and my boss, died, and his son took over. He was a wonderful guy, and everything was great. We, we, everybody got along great, but... The truth was I was not going to grow in that small town, that small business. So the son and I decided to part ways and I would, you know, take a handful of accounts and just do my own thing privately. So I started Roar Advertising. But back to Peterman, when I was at Peterman in spring of, spring of 85, early April 85, I got a call from Gail Del Corral, who, the owner and manager of Del Corral Madeline Talent, which is where, you know, that was Gail Del Corral. She called and she said, Jimmy Buffett wants you on his album cover because she had continued to send out what's called a composite, which is a, you know, a, a group of pictures, a card, a big postcard that shows different looks. And this particular, she sent out, it was, a, I think it was my composite from Japan, and she continued to send that out, unbeknownst to me, actually, because hmm. I was only four you know, four hours away from New Orleans. And so she called, she said, Jimmy Buffett wants you to be on this album cover. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. And that's how that came about. (laughs) Now, were you aware of Jimmy Buffett at that point? Oh, of course. (laughs) Yes. Very aware of Jimmy Buffett. Yes. I, of course, is anyone not aware of Jimmy Buffett? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I, I knew Jimmy Buffett very, I didn't know him at all, but I certainly knew of his music. I love his music. What did you find his personality to be like when you met him face to face? A warm southern gentleman, very funny, very smart. Just you know, just very easy, very easy going, easy to be with as was the the crew, you know, I just kind of fell in and they they couldn't have been nicer. You know, they just jump in the car and go look like I said we're looking for props and things for the for the covers and they just could not have been nicer. And, of course, you know, it was more than just the shoot. We would have meals together and dinners together and drinks together, and it was fun. It was just, you know, great fun. It was as much fun as you can imagine it would be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Galatoire was closed, and, you know, they, and it was an easy, just an easygoing group of people, just very Southern, very Southern charm. We were set up in a... I don't, it wasn't really a, a hotel. It was someone's home, I think, or a very small boutique hotel. One of these things where the courtyard was in the back in New Orleans and everybody had rooms that kind of surrounded this courtyard. And it's just easy. It was fun. Now, if anybody finds themselves in New Orleans at the restaurant where this picture was taken, Galatois, what do you recommend that they get there? Trout, Munier, Munier with crab meat and sweet breads, if one likes sweet breads, I love them, and uh, turtle soup. And that's a lot of food for me. I usually share all of that with my husband, and the bread is the best in ever. <laughs> it's the best I've ever had. So be careful with the bread because you will fill up. <laughs> so I think most stories are best from the beginning. Aurora, where were you born? I was born in Madrid, Spain. My father's from Barcelona, Barcelona, but back to that catalog. Right? Barcelona, Spain, and my mother's from Montgomery, Alabama. And it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a story that it probably be- reads better as a romance novel than a marriage, but it did last for 12 years. My mother became an opera singer. A whole other story. We might have to have more than one of these talks. <laughs> And my father was, uh, you know, his, his family's from Barcelona, but he, he and she wound up in Madrid after marrying. They met in Heidelberg. They married in North, Northern Africa. She was an opera singer. She was a writer and a professor. They met in Heidelberg. I don't know the circumstances exactly of their meeting, but they wound up living in Madrid, and my sister and I were born there. I left there when I was six months old. My father had an opportunity to go to Stanford University as a professor, so my sister was two and a half, and I was six months old, and we moved to California, Palo Alto. My mother left my father there, and 
you know, brave soul that she was, she just put two of us in the car and took whatever she took and drove across the country and went back home to Montgomery, Alabama, and we stayed with my grandfather in a little house behind the big house, which was a thing they have in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, she went back to school to finish her degree. Uh, as I mentioned, she was an opera singer, so she was interested in voice. And her degree was to be, and she was pursuing a degree in audiology and speech pathology. So she went to Huntington in, in, in Montgomery, and then we moved to Tuscaloosa, University of Alabama. She got her master's, and then she got a fellowship at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And that's how I wound up in Baltimore at about four years old, and my sister was seven. And we stayed there for most of our young lives and through high school. Just in the places that you've mentioned so far, and well, starting from the beginning in Spain, has there been a favorite place on this earth that you've been to? Oh, gosh. Well, my, my first response would be the place that I think of most as home, which would be my grandfather's house in Florosa, Florida, or near Fort Walton Beach. It's it, Actually, the address is Mary Esther, Florida. It's on Santa Rosa Sound. And, and if you were to stand at that house right now, you would still see the only thing that's the same in that area, which is uh, Okaloosa Island, it was a beautiful, pure white sand that looks like snow, and that looks like it does without a thousand condos and McMansions on it, only because it's owned by the government. It's owned by Eglin Air Force Base. So there's an Air Force Base right there, and so they still test, you know, they do, still do testing over that island, and it has remained just pristine. The rest of the area, not so much, as you can imagine. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've been to a lot of beautiful places. I would, my second place would probably be French Polynesia. That My husband and I were fortunate enough to vacation there. The diving, scuba diving was unbelievable. I remember thinking, you know, my mother was always so afraid when I flew, and I remember thinking at the time we didn't have cell phones, but I thought, you know, I just, if anything happens to me, fly, Mom. I hope it happens on the way home because I've, I've, already, I've already seen heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you just mentioned a moment ago your husband. Could you tell us a little bit about him? Oh, my husband. Yes. Actually, you should be interviewing him. He's very impressive. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He is Tom Birch. We own a group of radio stations together, Lakes Media. We have owned another group before that. It was Opus Media. I should get him on the phone to talk about himself, but I will tell you that, well, he's the love of my life. He's incredibly uh, talented. He's been in radio for 55 years, maybe more, but we'll call it 55. (laughs) He started a radio station in his bedroom in Binghamton, New York, that only broadcasts to his neighbors just because he loved it. I think he was, I'm pretty sure he was working in radio at 14, not a paid job, but probably, you know, the last time he swept floors, by the way, was probably (laughs) just to be around the radio people. And he, you know, we went through, he started out as a DJ to Loose Street Tom in New Orleans, meaning to Loose Street Tom in New Orleans, <laughs> and Beach Baby Birch in Miami, and Oklahoma, and he, it just goes on and on. But he all went from DJing to programming different parts of the country, and then from programming, he always dreamed of having radio stations. And so when I met him, he was owning radio stations, and one of those stations was in, for, in Destin, Florida, and I met him at a Christmas party in Destin, Florida, when I had a raw advertising. So I was a client, and he was, you know, he owned the radio station that I placed my advertisements on. How interesting. So you all met at a Christmas party. Yes. Interesting. Well, you know, I was just, I, I, was, it was just, I was a client at the, at the Christmas party, and it was, it was a, quite the Christmas party, because this is Destin, Florida, and this is the world of flip-flops and, you know, bathing suits and cover-ups and very, very casual. So what they decided to do was to have a formal black tie Christmas party. It was quite successful. People came from, you know, advertising. I I was living in New Orleans at the time, and I came from New Orleans, and it was on a Tuesday. And the reason it was on a Tuesday is because he traded it out, you know, where by the the restaurant and would, would trade out this party space and the, and the food 
for advertising on the radio. And that was the time they could do it. So believe it or not, on a Tuesday in December, I think it was December 12th, 1989, on a Tuesday in December, we, you know, that's when the, the whole world came out. Not only the people in Destin, but Houston people came, Atlanta people came, I came, and uh, it was quite successful. Now, Aurora, when you got the letter from me that I sent in the mail, just to tell all the listeners out there, the people who regularly listen, they know what an inquisitive person I am. But going back to 2007 on BuffettNews.com, there were people who were speculating about who is the woman on the cover of Last Mango in Paris. Then I decided that I was going to try to, for once and all, I was going to find out who is the mystery woman. And when that happened, somebody in the Buffett News Facebook group, the question came up again. When you saw this letter from who on earth is Paul Leslie, was there any kind of like, I don't know if I'm ready to reveal who I am yet? Or did you think, is this a crazy person writing to me? <laughs> what was going through your head? I didn't think it was a crazy person writing to me, but we have, you know, I, I, I don't, I, <laughs> I hate to involve all this, but, you know, you contacted me in December. I think that I have the distinction of being the most reluctant interviewee to date, if I'm not wrong, right? <laughs> no, Aurora. There are people, not naming any names, that I have stayed in, I, I stayed in touch with them for years and years and years before we finally got to sit down. I'll name one person, a very successful songwriter and drummer named Roger Guth. We talked about it forever, and then it finally happened. So, that was funny. Well, I, 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 I appreciate your patience. I, I just had a very hard time believing that Anybody would tune in, and if you are tuning in, you're still listening. God bless. <laughs> That's, you know, it's so many years later. I just found it very hard to believe that anybody had a great interest in who was, you know, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of a prop on an album because it's, you know, it's Jimmy Buffett. You know, sometimes it's a parrot, and sometimes it's a girl who's playing the third world girl from Buzios. So I. I was just, you know, a little incredulous. But back to your letter, I, I, I'm the only reason I opened your letter. You know, that, you know, I didn't know who it was. The only reason I opened, I get so, I get very few, real, very little real mail in the mailbox these days. So I opened it because I do have a respect for people who write a handwritten letter, and so I think I owe it to the person who took the time to write it to read it. But I really believed it was going to be a solicitation to join some religious group. I did. <laughs> so I read it. I, it but, and Tom showed it to me. He said, you, wanna, you want this? I said, yeah, what's up? And so I read it, and I was, I was just incredulous. I didn't, I didn't think you I, – I believed it. I mean, you knew too much about me. I, don't, I think you should share with the audience how you knew so much about me. I mean, you really went through a lot to, to find me. I mean, I changed my name from D.F. Plaha to Birch. I had moved a number of times. And, you know, I, I found it very hard to believe that you had, but you didn't just guess that you found me. You knew you found me. You didn't say, you didn't say are you? You said you are. Well, maybe not exactly like that, but I knew you knew that I was the person on the cover. Not that I was hiding it from anybody, but I, I was supposed to get a credit on the album, but I didn't for whatever reason. So... And that's probably just as well. I kind of like this mystery thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, to tell the listeners out there, I am a bit of a sleuth. I Years ago, I worked for a pack of lawyers. And one of the things that they would have me do is find out things and also find people who were just, that fallen off of the map. I wasn't 100% sure that you were, in fact, the Aurora. But I was 99.9% .9 sure it was a handwritten letter. When I sealed it and dropped it in the mailbox, I thought, I will probably never hear from this person. And sure enough, I was wrong, and you got in contact. And I was like, wow, I found the mystery woman. <laughs> Well, it was it was very impressive, really was. I was 
I was shocked. I, I, I didn't, I appreciate you taking the time to do it. And again, I'm a bit incredulous that you did, but I do appreciate it. Let me ask you this. What is the best thing about being Aurora Diaz Plaja Birch? My husband and my kids and my grandkids. Your family. And my, my dear, 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 wonderful friends. I think it's the best thing about being anybody is your family and your friends. And I hold on to them tightly. I've lost some very dear ones recently and don't get me started. <laughs> hmm. Well, so, well, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'm still collecting myself. <laughs> well, I always like to end my broadcasts. I give the guest the stage and you can imagine I've heard every kind of answer from big hearted stuff to somebody who just came out with an album and they say, go buy my album or go buy a ticket. But I always let the last word be up to the guest. For anyone who's joining us, wherever they are, what would you say to anybody who's tuned in? Hold close to your loved ones and treasure every moment. Enjoy the gift of every day because you never know what tomorrow brings. And remember that the greatest things in life are not things. That's lovely. Aurora, thank you so much. It's been such an honor. And I, I'd like to say, I haven't met you and Tom in person, but I'd like to say that you all are my friends. Well, I like to say so, too. I've had, we've had many, many conversations over the last five months by email, and I think we spoke maybe, I know, I know once prior to getting ready for this interview. But we're looking forward to seeing you in New Orleans. I'm not in New Orleans. Well, maybe New Orleans as well. We probably <laughs> won't face Jazz Fest together. But we will definitely come to Charleston, and if you are heading this way and exploring the North Carolina area, we're heading to Virginia Beach, as we've talked about. You're always welcome, and we will lo we would love we'd love to meet you and get together with you. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. Looking forward. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and again, for all of those who are still listening, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> God bless. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Paul. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Until next time. All right, talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. We thank you and appreciate you dropping in for the Paul Leslie Hour today. You know, you can help the Paul Leslie Hour in our mission to provide independent media content like this by visiting www.thepaulleslie.com slash support. We truly thank you. This is your announcer speaking. Performance of the Entertainer intro song and Corina Corina outro song, courtesy of John Primerano. Well, that's it for today. So until next time, be safe and be good.